Welcome to Rare We Love Comics More Than I'm About To Make You All Very Jealous. I'm your ridiculously excited host, Eris Quinones. Yes, my friends, I am stupid excited. Why, you ask? Well, not only have we been looking forward to this episode for months, but I also have an amazing announcement for you guys. And what is this amazingly amazing announcement, you're wondering? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. This Monday, April 23rd, we've partnered with our great friends over at Comic Cave Studios to send Team Variant to Hollywood to attend the world premiere of Avengers Infinity War. And the good news is that we're taking you guys with us. We're going to be posting pictures, videos, and stories all over our Instagram and Facebook throughout the entire trip. We'll also be streaming Variant Live from Hollywood Boulevard, right here on our YouTube channel, before the party begins. Then around 5 p.m. Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be live streaming and posting on Instagram and Facebook directly from the red carpet to bring you guys as much of the glorious madness as possible. Guys, this is gonna be nuts. Infinity War is not only the culmination of 10 years of Marvel movies, it's also one of the biggest movie events of all time, and we're gonna be experiencing it together. So if you're not already following us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, now is definitely the time to do that. And we can't move on without saying a huge thank you to the team over at Comic Cave Studios for inviting us out and partnering with us to witness comic book movie history. We love you all so much. Now with that first bit of awesome covered, let's move on to the second. Today we're going to be recapping the first 10 years of the Marvel Cinematic Universe to give you guys a nice overview and refresher before you hit your local theater next week to see Avengers Affinity War. To be clear, I'm going to run down all 18 MCU movies that have been released so far. That includes Black Panther. So if you've been living under a rock for the past decade and are worried about spoilers for these movies, there's your warning. With that said, let's kick things off with the movie that started it all. In 2008, we got the first Iron Man. This movie had to do some heavy lifting, as it was responsible for setting the tone for the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe and introducing the world to one of its biggest and most important heroes. I'm of course referring to the genius billionaire playboy philanthropist, Tony Stark, aka Iron Man. Now because this movie carried such a heavy responsibility for everything that followed it, getting the casting right for Tony Stark was crucial. Well, as we all know, Kevin Feige and Jon Favreau knocked it out of the park by landing Robert Downey Jr. for the role, the first of what would prove to be a long run of brilliant casting choices for Marvel. Anyway, when we're first introduced to Stark, he's a greedy and shallow weapons manufacturer who is showing off some new missiles for the US military. On their way back to base, the convoy Tony is traveling with is ambushed and he's kidnapped by terrorists who want him to build them weapons. However, during the ambush, one of the exploding mines left Tony with metal shrapnel in his chest, and the only thing keeping it from reaching his heart was was an electromagnet implanted in his chest. But Tony Stark is a freaking genius, so he uses the parts he has available, mostly consisting of Stark industry weapons that the terrorists either bought or stole, to build a powerful mini arc reactor. He then embedded the arc reactor in his chest to replace the electromagnet in protecting his heart, but also to power the Mark I suit of armor that he built with the remaining parts, which he used to escape the terrorists who were holding him captive. Tony then returned home and with a very different perspective of his business, decides to stop all weapons manufacturing and instead focus further on developing his arc reactor technology and suit of armor. We later see him take flight for the first time in the Mark II suit, before fully taking on the mantle of Iron Man in the Mark III armor, where he saves an entire village of people from terrorists and destroys all of their weapons. It's glorious. In the end, the first Iron Man gave us Iron Man's origin, introduced us to S.H.I.E.L.D., and several important characters like Colonel James Rhodes, who was played by Terrence Howard in this movie, but also Pepper Potts, Agent Phil Coulson, Happy Hogan, and Nick Fury, who asked Tony to join the Avengers in the post credit scene. Then in 2008 as well, we got The Incredible Hulk with Edward Norton playing Bruce Banner slash The Hulk. It seems many people forget this movie is even part of the MCU, but it gave us a few key pieces, including the Hulk's MCU origin, as Banner accidentally poisons himself with gamma radiation while trying to replicate the super soldier serum that created Captain America, creating the Hulk instead. We're also introduced to the love of Bruce Banner's life, Betty Ross, her warmonger father, Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, who tries to capture Hulk and exploit his power, and Abomination, who clashes with the Hulk in a brutal fight that destroys Harlem at the end of the movie. Other than that, this one didn't have much of an impact on the MCU's broader story arc. Even the post credit scene between Tony Stark and General Ross that implied S.H.I.E.L.D. wanted to involve Ross in the Avengers Initiative was retconned in 2011 by a Marvel one-shot short film called The Consultant, so not much more to see here. 
But in 2010, Iron Man 2 arrived with Tony Stark facing battles on multiple fronts. The arc reactor in his chest is slowly poisoning him every time he uses his now dramatically improved armor. The US government is pushing him to give up his technology for military use, and a crazy revenge-fueled villain named Whiplash is trying to kill him. So Nick Fury steps in and gives Tony some of his father's scientific research to help fix his heart problem. Then Iron Man joins forces with Rhodey, who is now played by Don Cheadle, and makes his first appearance as War Machine to take down Whiplash and an army of hammer drones, which is one of the coolest battle scenes in the MCU, in our opinion. Overall, Iron Man 2 gave us greater character development for Tony Stark, built on his relationship with Rhodey and Pepper Potts, introduced Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow, and further fleshed out S.H.I.E.L.D. as an organization including Nick Fury telling Stark that he's unsuited for the Avengers Initiative. The post credit scene of Iron Man 2 also set up our introduction to another key hero in the MCU, when we see Agent Coulson confirm Thor's hammer has been located in the desert. Which leads us to the first Thor movie in 2011, where we're introduced to the entire world of Asgard, including key characters like Thor, his brother Loki, Odin, and Heimdall the Gatekeeper. This was yet another round of amazing casting choices almost across the board, with Chris Hemsworth cast as Thor, Tom Hiddleston as Loki, Anthony Hopkins as Odin, and Idris Elba as Heimdall. I mean, come on! We also get our first introductions to a few powerful relics, most notably Thor's hammer Mjolnir and the Tesseract, which we would later learn gains its power from the Space Stone at its core. Just one of the five Infinity Stones to appear in the MCU thus far. Anyway, after the Frost Giants attempt to steal the Tesseract and interrupt Thor's coronation as king, an angry Thor impulsively uses the Bifrost to attack the Frost Giants on their homeworld, effectively starting a war. Odin is then forced to strip Thor of his power, including his ability to use Mjolnir, and casted him out of Asgard, stranding him on Earth until he could get his crap together. After arriving on Earth, he meets astrophysicist Eric Solvig and Jane Foster. He eventually falls in love with Jane and finds his way back to being worthy to wield his hammer through his relationship with her. But not before he has a run-in with S.H.I.E.L.D. and we see Jeremy Renner make his first appearance as Clint Barton aka Hawkeye. In the meantime, Odin falls into his god sleep and Loki, who we learn is an adopted frost giant baby, ascends to the throne in Thor's absence. But Thor regains his power and his use of Mjolnir, and returns to save Asgard and the cosmos from Loki. However, the Bifrost Bridge is destroyed in the process. By the end, this movie introduces several key characters, establishes magic in the MCU as a misunderstood science, and gives us the first disguised Infinity Stone. Not too shabby. Next, 2011 gave us Captain America the First Avenger, and introduced us to Chris Evans as Captain America. Another great draft pick. The movie centered around Cap's origin as a super soldier during World War II, but also introduced and gave us the origin of Hydra. The first Avenger established several very important relationships for Steve Rogers as well, including the introduction of Bucky Barnes as Steve Rogers' best friend and fellow member of the Halloween Commandos, Howard Stark, and Peggy Carter. Cap's love interest, who would go on to become a founding member of S.H.I.E.L.D. along with Stark. This addition to the MCU also shows how the Tesseract ends up with S.H.I.E.L.D. when Howard Stark finds it at the bottom of an ocean while searching for Cap's downed plane. I'll also add that during the final battle between Cap and Red Skull on the plane, Red Skull doesn't actually die. We just see him transported away somewhere when he picks up the Tesseract by hand. So could we see him reappear at some point? You never know. The last thing we see in this movie is Cap waking up in modern day, after finally being found in ice and defrosted, 70 years after he crashed. And as Steve struggles to wrap his mind around it, he is approached by Nick Fury to join the Avengers team and help him save the world in a post credit scene. But save the world from what? Well, that leads us to the Avengers in 2012. This is the first time that all the heroes come together to face a threat, which in this case is Loki, who makes his way to Earth, steals the Tesseract from S.H.I.E.L.D., manipulates the mind of Hawkeye and Eric Selvig using a powerful scepter to turn them into his minions, turn the heroes against one another, murders Agent Coulson, then uses the Tesseract to open a space portal that allows a Chitauri army to invade. But thankfully, the Avengers have a Hulk, as Mark Ruffalo made his MCU debut as Bruce Banner. And after some turmoil, Agent Coulson's death unites the team of Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, Black Widow, and Hawkeye to defeat Loki and the Chitauri. And they do it in epic fashion during the Battle for New York. When the dust settles, phase one of the MCU was complete. And in the post credit scene, Thanos makes his first appearance as the big bad heading into phase two and beyond. The second disguise in Infinity Stone is also introduced in this movie as Loki's powerful scepter. But we'll get back to that in a bit. Now before we move into phase two, let's keep the lights on. Domain.com is a one-stop shop for domains, websites, and reliable web hosting. From .com and .net domain names to intuitive website builders, they've got all your website needs covered. Domain.com is awesome. They're affordable, reliable, and have all the tools you need to build a new website. And with affordable everyday pricing on .com domains, you can easily start sharing your ideas with the world on a professional website. After all, Dotomate Extension will help you tell your story like a .com or .net domain name. And if you want to brand yourself online, Domain.com has over 300 domain extensions to fit your needs, from 
.club to .space. If that's not enough, the guys at Domain.com are also great friends of Variant, and to show their love, they're giving you 15% off their already affordable prices on domain names, web hosting, and email when you use the coupon code Variant at checkout. So take that first step to creating an identity online, and when you think domain names, think Domain.com. In 2013, Iron Man 3 opened up Phase 2 for the MCU, with Tony suffering from PTSD after the events in New York and obsessing about the next possible attack to the extent that he creates an entire army of Iron Man Sentinel suits. This movie had an altogether forgettable villain in Aldrich Killian and gave us the fake Mandarin, which was thankfully later retconned with a one-shot short film called Long Live the King. In the short, it's established that there is a real Mandarin out there, but he has yet to actually appear in the MCU. In the movie, Tony Stark also has surgery to remove the remaining shrapnel from his chest, along with the mini arc reactor, and he has his oceanfront house blown up by terrorists. But the movie contributed little else to the MCU as a whole, so let's move on to the other Marvel movie of 2013, and that's Thor The Dark World. Similar to Iron Man 3, Thor The Dark World's story begins with Thor cleaning up the mess created by the events of the Avengers, as Loki is sentenced to life in an Asgardian prison, and the Tesseract is locked away in an Asgardian vault. But Thor also has to deal with the convergence of the Nine Realms, his lady friend Jane Foster accidentally discovering and being possessed by a mysterious power called the Aether, and the homicidal Dark Elves who want it for themselves. Thor then brings the Aether-infected Jane to Asgard for help, the Dark Elves show up to take it, and the Dark Elf in charge Malekith kills Thor's mother, Frigga. This causes a traumatized Odin to go a bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, and a desperate Thor turns to Loki for help to defeat the Dark Elves. The Aether is later extracted from Jane by the Dark Elves on their world, and Thor and Loki manage to rescue her, but Loki seemingly dies in the process. Which of course is another one of Loki's tricks, and he actually returns to Asgard and uses the same powers of illusion to disguise himself as Odin. Meanwhile, Thor chases Malekith to Earth, and with some scientific assistance from Jane Foster and Eric Selvig, Malekith and the Dark Elves are defeated. The Aether, which we find out is the Reality Stone in a post credit scene, is contained and delivered to the Collector for safekeeping. Then in 2014, we got two of the MCU's best movies, Captain America Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy. These are two very different movies in terms of style and tone, but both are freaking amazing in their own way. In Winter Soldier, we learn more about Black Widow and see her friendship with Captain America develop. And we're introduced to both Sam Wilson, who becomes Falcon, and the Winter Soldier, who we find out is Steve's thought-to-be-dead buddy, Bucky Barnes. We learned that Bucky survived his fall from the train in the first Avenger, and was captured, enhanced, and brainwashed by Hydra. Cap and Black Widow also then discover that Hydra was alive and well, and that in the years since World War II, Hydra has infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. and governments to carry out long-term plans to take over the world. By the end, Nick Fury is nearly killed, Cap, Black Widow, and Falcon stop Hydra from carrying out their plan, S.H.I.E.L.D. is dismantled, and Bucky begins to remember who he is with Cap's help. Lastly, in the end credit scene, we learn that the remaining Hydra agents are in possession of the scepter Loki used in Avengers, and we get the first appearance of the twins, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. Witcher Soldier is just a beautiful piece of action-packed art, and arguably among the MCU's top two or three films. Next, we have the Guardians of the Galaxy, where we're introduced to Peter Quill, aka Star-Lord, Gamora, who we learn is the daughter of Thanos, Drax the Destroyer, a talking tree named Groot, and a trigger-happy raccoon named Rocket. This team reluctantly comes together to take on the power-hungry Kree Lord, Ronan the Accuser, who seeks to destroy Xandar with an orb that turns out to contain the Power Stone, which is the fourth Infinity Stone introduced in the MCU. Oh, and the Guardians are also being hunted by Yondu and his band of Ravengers, who are after the orb for themselves. The movie also introduces us to Gamora's sister, Nebula, and sets up the fact that they both hate their father, Thanos. And let's not forget that they're not too fond of each other either. Anyway, after an intense space battle to save Xandar, Groot sacrificing himself to save the rest of the team, and an epic one-sided dance-off, the Guardians lock hands and are able to use the Power Stone to kill Ronan. They then turn the Infinity Stone over to the Nova Corps for safekeeping, and we are introduced to the MCU's cutest character, Baby Groot. Phase 2 then wraps up with Avengers Age of Ultron and Ant-Man in 2015, starting with Age of Ultron. Like all the team movies, there's a lot to unpack here, but... Here we go. The movie starts with the Avengers Assault on the last Hydra base, during which Hawkeye is injured, the team has their first run-in with Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, and Iron Man retrieves the powerful scepter Hydra was experimenting with. But not before Scarlet Witch casts a spell on Tony's mind and gives him a vision of the rest of the Avengers lying dead on the ground, with Cap telling him, you could have saved us, why didn't you do more? with his dying breath. This heavily affects Tony, and after making sure Hawkeye's injuries are fixed using new tissue regeneration technology, Stark convinces Bruce Banner to help him harness the intelligence of the gem inside the scepter, which turns out to be the Mind Stone, in order to create Ultron and sync it with his Iron Legion droids to protect the planet from outside threats. 
But when the tests finally succeed and Ultron comes to life, he becomes immediately hostile and sees humanity and the Avengers as the great threats of the planet. So he destroys Jarvis, takes over the Iron Legion, and surprise attacks the Avengers before escaping using the internet. The fact that Stark and Banner caused this by experimenting on the Scepter without discussing it with the rest of the team creates serious tension between Cap and Stark. Meanwhile, Ultron builds himself a powerful new body, recruits Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, and builds himself an army of duplicates of himself. When the Avengers confront Ultron and the twins, Scarlet Witch corrupts the minds of the team and leaves them damaged and splintered. Her spells even send Hulk into a full rampage, forcing Iron Man to don his Hulkbuster armor for the first time. The entire team then retreats to Clint Barton's secret family home to recover, Thor takes off into the cosmos in search for answers to the vision he had, and Ultron hijacks the regeneration chamber to create a perfect body for himself, for which he extracts the Mind Stone from the Scepter and embeds it in the body, all while using his army of duplicates to turn Sokovia into a flying city. Later, the Avengers get the regeneration chamber back from Ultron, and after a confrontation between Stark, Banner, and Cap over what to do with the body inside the chamber, Thor returns with a revelation about the Infinity Stone and hits the chamber with lightning, giving life to the body and introducing us to Vision. After a massive final battle that destroys Sokovia, the Avengers, now including Vision, defeat Ultron and save many of the city's people. But at a high cost. The movie also marks the first appearance of Ulysses Claw, who gives us the first mention of Wakanda in the MCU. It also gives us the first verbal description of the six Infinity Stones after Thor's visions, and shows Thanos putting on the Infinity Gauntlet to go after the stones himself in the post credit scene. I told you there was a lot, but next we got Ant-Man, which introduced us to Hank Pym as a former member of S.H.I.E.L.D. who quit because Howard Stark and the others were trying to replicate his shrinking tech. We're also introduced to his daughter, Hope Van Dyne, who is set to become the Wasp by the end of the movie, and ex-con Scott Lang, who is trained by Pym and his daughter to become Ant-Man. We also get a run-in between Ant-Man and Falcon when Scott breaks into the Avengers facility to steal a piece of Pym's tech, setting the stage for Ant-Man's involvement with the team later on. Finally, the post credit scene teases what comes next by showing that Cap and Falcon had managed to find and capture Bucky. And that, my friends, leads us to Phase 3 and Captain America Civil War in 2016. This is without question one of Marvel's best movies, and also arguably the one with the most implications for the MCU. In summary, the Ultron situation and the events of Sokovia, mixed with a botched attempt by Scarlet Witch to discard a bomb that killed several civilians, causes the governments of the world to create the Sokovia Accords, which brings the Avengers under the supervision of the United Nations. This, of course, divides the Avengers into two camps, those that believe the Accords are necessary, led by Iron Man, and those who believe the Avengers should not be under the control of a government because of the potential for corruption and abuse, led by Captain America. In the middle of the debate about the Accords, Cap finds out that Peggy Carter died, and while attending her funeral, a bomb goes off at the United Nations where the Accords were being signed, killing Wakanda's king, T'Chaka. Bucky gets framed for it and Cap sets out to protect his friend, backed up by Falcon and his new boo, Agent Carter. However, after finding Bucky and trying to help him escape the police, and a very angry and vengeful T'Challa slash Black Panther, Cap makes himself a criminal and is arrested. A scene that marks Black Panther's first appearance in the MCU, and it does not disappoint. Cap later learns that Baron Zemo was behind the whole thing, and his real goal was to gain access to Bucky so he could extract information from him about the location of the old Hydra base that holds five more Hydra super soldiers like Bucky. But on the way to the Quinjet, they clash with the Avengers on the opposing side, including Iron Man, War Machine, Black Widow, Black Panther, Vision, and Spider-Man, who also makes his big MCU debut in that scene wearing a new suit designed by Stark. Cap and Bucky then get away to find Zemo while the rest of Cap's team holds off Iron Man and the others. But when the fight is over, Rhodey slash War Machine is seriously injured. The remaining members of Cap's team are imprisoned and we're left with the greatest fight sequence in the MCU to date. Cap and Bucky eventually find the Hydra base, and after gaining new information, Stark realizes he made a mistake, and catches up to help them find Zemo. But when they do, Zemo plays a video of a specific Winter Soldier mission showing a brainwashed Bucky killing Tony's parents, after which Cap admits he knew about it. This revealed Zemo's true goal of tearing the Avengers apart by having them turn on each other. And man, did it work. Tony understandably tries to kill Bucky, Steve understandably tries to protect his lifelong friend, and in the end, Iron Man's suit is wrecked, Cap walks away from a shield, and their relationship is destroyed. It's just nuts. But before the credits roll, we see Rhodey learning to walk again, and Cap breaking his team out of the floating prison. And finally, the post credit scene shows T'Challa giving Steve and Bucky asylum in Wakanda and committing to help cure Bucky's mind, as well as Peter Parker discovering more features of his new suit. Civil War was followed by Doctor Strange, which introduced the multiverse and the mystic arts into the MCU, along with Doctor Steve 
Stephen Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme known as the Ancient One, Mordo, Wong, and the three sanctums that create a magical barrier around the Earth to protect it from very powerful dark forces in the universe, like Dormammu. The movie also gives us the origin of Doctor Strange, introduces several new mystical relics, most notably the Eye of Agamotto, and sets up Doctor Strange as the new protector of the New York City Sanctum. But what is the significance of the Eye of Agamotto? Well, it contains our fifth Infinity Stone, the Time Stone. In the post credit scenes, Doctor Strange meets Thor for the first time, and we also see a disturbed Mordo vow to kill all the sorcerers because he believes it's the only way to stop them from violating natural law. In 2017, we got three additions to the MCU in a single year for the very first time, with Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, and Thor Ragnarok. In Guardians 2, we're introduced to the Sovereign and their High Priestess named Aisha. Rocky Balboa appears as the leader of the Ravengers who exiles Yondu. We learn that Star-Lord's dad is a living planet named Ego who seeks to remake the universe into his own image. Mantis is introduced and added to the team. Star-Lord learns that he has powers, only to quickly lose them when Ego is destroyed. Yondu dies saving Peter and earns his redemption. Nebula and Gamora reconcile, after which Nebula leaves to hunt down Thanos, and Groot becomes a teenager. The movie also hints that Stan Lee could actually be one of the Watchers in the MCU, or possibly even the one above all which is pretty funny. And in one of the post credit scenes, we get a hint at Aisha possibly creating Adam Warlock in one of the Sovereign's birthing pots. Then in Spider-Man Homecoming, we get the expansion of Peter's story within the MCU, further development of his relationship with Tony Stark, a full introduction to a very attractive Aunt May, the introduction of Adrian Toom slash Vulture, who is played very perfectly by Michael Keaton, and we see Peter begin to come into his own both as a person and with his powers. We also get our first look at the Iron Spider suit he'll be wearing in Infinity War. And finally, in the end credit scene, May catches Peter in his Spider-Man suit. It's a lot of fun from start to finish. Then, to close out 2017 for the MCU, we got Thor Ragnarok. This movie was a complete departure in tone from Thor, adding a very colorful look and a lot more humor. For some fans, it really worked, and for others, the jokes are just over the top. Either way, this movie begins with Thor killing Surtur to prevent Ragnarok. He then returns to Asgard after being gone for a long time, only to find Loki using his power of illusion to pose as Odin. Thor then takes Loki and finds the real Odin somewhere in Norway with a little help from Doctor Strange. But they arrive just in time for Odin to tell him that he was dying and that his death would release their powerful and psychotic sister, Hela, from her prison. Odin then disappears into Stardust and Hela immediately appears. She tells Thor and Loki to kneel and Thor responds by throwing Mjolnir at her, but she catches it and shatters it into pieces without breaking a sweat. Loki then makes the mistake of calling for the Bifrost Bridge to escape and Hela follows him into it. During the transfer, she knocks both Thor and Loki out of the bridge, landing them both on the garbage planet Sakaar. Throughout the rest of the movie, Hela takes over Asgard, kills most of the Asgardian warriors, we're introduced to the Grand Master, who is one of the elders of the universe, Thor ends up fighting as a gladiator in a Roman Colosseum type battle to the death, in which the Hulk turns out to be the champion, and the two battle it out. We also learn that the Hulk speaks like a child and it's hilarious, we meet Valkyrie and learn about her backstory, Thor loses an eye fighting Hela, then taps into god powers for the first time, Hulk fights a giant wolf, then Hela is seemingly killed by a revived Satur, and Thor, Loki, Hulk, and Valkyrie manage to get what was left of the Asgardian people off the planet just before Asgard is completely destroyed. Everything seems to be great until the post credit scene where we see a massive ship appear in front of the one Thor is using to transport his people to Earth. And considering later trailers for Infinity War show that Thor is slamming into the windshield of the Guardian's ship in space, I think it's safe to assume that it's Thanos' starship we see. And last but certainly not least, my friends, we have this past February's Black Panther solo movie. This movie introduces us and the MCU to the world of Wakanda, and it's amazing. We see T'Challa earned his place as King and Black Panther in ritual combat. We are introduced to the Royal Wakandan Guards called the Dora Milan led by the awesome General Okoye, we meet T'Challa's genius sister and head of Wakandan technology, Shuri, along with Nakia. We also get a couple of great villains in Ulysses' Claw, and T'Challa's cousin, Eric Killmonger, who seeks to overthrow T'Challa, take the throne of Wakanda for himself, and use Wakandan tech to rule the world. By the end of the movie, Claw is killed by Killmonger. T'Challa, who nearly died at the hands of his lunatic cousin, returns to reclaim his throne by defeating and killing Killmonger, and T'Challa decides to open Wakanda to the rest of the world. In the end credit scenes, we see T'Challa go before the United Nations and announce his intentions to share his nation resources with other countries. And Bucky Barnes appears after Shuri figures out how to remove the Hydra programming from his mind. Which of course is the final piece needed before we head into Infinity War next week. But that's it guys, our history of slash recap of the first 10 years of the Marvel
Marvel Cinematic Universe to get you guys ready for what's coming. Let us know what some of your favorite moments are in the comments section down below. But that brings today's episode to a close, but remember, the great people at Comic Cave Studios is sending us to the world premiere of Avengers Infinity War this Monday, April 23rd, so be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and our website to keep up with all the festivities. But if you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe and then hit the bell next to it so you're notified whenever we upload a new video. But I'll see you guys next time when I talk about all things comics.